Hello. My name is James Patrick Reed. That was the easiest part. Um, really don't like doing this, so maybe that'll help get the uh, trepidation uh, out of the way. I don't know. Um, more to introduce myself than to really explain much of anything right now. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have been able to be in a situation most of my life where it's been reflective and I've had a lot of chance to study. Um, in that process of juvenile redirection, I was there was a lot of things put in front of me to try to stimulate my brain, keep me on something productive rather than just into everything. I, I destroyed everything. I took everything apart and I wanted to know everything about everything and nothing was off the table. Everything I needed to know. Um, I'm not as nosy as I used to be as when I was younger. I uh, started to figure out a purpose for some of those things and then started to as I got older realized that what I was doing was um, was part of the autism traits where I was uh, information gathering and I was keeping these active parts of my thought available and open to readily pick up a new set of information or a little piece of something or allow something to illuminate the surface of something else and then I oh gotta look at that now and so tangents have always been my life um, in 2001 Google Earth was launched uh, originally it wasn't a web-based thing it was the was meant for I can't remember exactly what it would be meant for other than to allow a, a normal person like myself to look at the globe to see what the earth looked like and to, in real time look wherever you want I thought that was amazing uh, fantastic new set of spectacles a new light a new desk lamp shining down on something to be able to see our world differently. And in the early years of it, it was admittedly, you know, like a lot of the, um, get in the History Channel and History Channel has gone so far away from history and then it's gotten into this speculative nonsense of aliens. Um, it was fun to look for anomalous features in places like Peru and Egypt and, um, and anywhere else that, that could show something that might give you the feeling that you discovered something. And I spent hours and hours and hours, you know, going from, uh, first it was uh, looking down in New Mexico and Nevada at some of the nuclear testing. And that was incredibly eye-opening and astonishing the scale really that we did it over and over and over again and for what we are aware of modern times the fact that we're not testing like that anymore we don't have a sense of that scale um, and to a large degree with the globe we don't have a very good sense of scale either um, we know how big it is, we measure, we tell ourselves, and we give the stinking analogy, uh, or the, <laughs> I hate, wow, if, if you put this next to 1,200 football fields and 16 buses, like, hey, come on, 
it, we don't understand scale the way I think we need or we could understand scale. Uh, and I, in searching for the ways to describe uh, some of the reasons why I found what I found, scale is a big part of it because in geology, we sit down, we look at our surface that we're studying, we draw out our layers, and we dissect at the difference between everything it looks like and what it actually is. And in that process, we've got definitions for things that we've been given over time. And for the purposes of geology and training and the education that pertains to what we know now, we do a lot of localized uh, field work where we work an area, you know, put on our, my, write down our findings, whatever it is we're looking for in that. And then we go to another area and it takes an incredibly long time for an individual or for a department or a group of people to go through location after location after location after location and tie those together as a unit, as one thing. Um, and because of the scale of the globe, I just in my perception, the way that I could see these things that it, the the land in front of me was no different than the yard I dug in when I was a kid it was no different than the hose the garden hose jetting out a high pressure blast of water that I'd jam into the grass and I would watch it excavate or and I'd let that flow and I'd see the white froth that would develop on the surface of the water and then how those ribbons of froth would come together and they would start to resemble similar features that you see in lava. Repeat forms in nature that seemed and still seem now to be evident in the large scale features of the globe. So why is it not explained that way? The complicated terms that we've arrived to explain the things that we believe are happening on the planet uh, because we have for no other explanation than we didn't have the tools until 2001. And then with that tool, um, you know, I'd assume that it takes every sailor when he puts the telescope up to his eye, an adjustment moment to understand that it, you have to have it at the right distance from your pupil to be able to focus. And so it takes some time to understand the feature, what was what was I looking at? The neat thing was that for me, I was born Weezer, Idaho, right on the opposite side of the state of Yellowstone. Yellowstone was a big thing for me growing up, been there several times, fascinated at the these stones that you'd pick up and throw in the bathtub and they float. The earwigs crawl out. Um, thanks grandma when I went to this place that had a, a degree of rock from these stones that would float to these this glass that could cut your arm off 
it started pretty early the fascination and the curiosity and why this was the way it was why it was that way here why it wasn't that way somewhere else um, then when I was nine years old we moved to California and I got to experience the Sierra Nevadas and these monolithic towering features of granite that was kind of different because there's a lot of basalt and volcanic material in the basin here in the Snake River Valley Treasure Valley, Magic Valley area they call it all kinds of things um, and it's a little bit different than it is down in Southern California and it wasn't necessarily all that interesting in Southern California other than the earthquakes we got down there in 89 and so we went through some significant ones and uh, the last big ones in the mid 90s and there haven't been any of those since thank goodness uh, but I took took some geology in high school believe it or not the I was in a, a, a an alternative school like it's not an alternative school like um, is more known now it was a school for only foster kid and group home kids and I was in a group home and in this school we had uh, a, my art teacher was also a geologist and so she had she en really enjoyed teaching us about rocks and we took a, a trip down Route 66 somewhere out in the desert and we dug some trilobite fossils and and uh, and I found a segment which at the time we didn't identify as a segment of a trilobite uh, that this segment looked like a, a fossil that she hadn't seen before so we got to take a trip down to the college and check out their department and and, and really get a little bit further into this tangent and, and studying the stuff you dig out of the ground. Um, I can't really say that that did a lot because I, you know, as any other kid, I wanted to go dig a T-Rex. So I didn't want a brachiopod or a trilobite. Um, and so I was still looking for more, still eager for more. Um, and when somebody tells me something and there's still the underlying dialogue that comes later that says what we don't know I get really stubborn and kind of irritated and, and like okay well why don't you know that you're the authority now so as the authority what position does that put you in to now tell me after I've paid my tuition that you don't know I'm sad now I'm sad now because now I can't rely on that material so much and then in instinctually start searching again so I ran into a lot of things that I I've seen other people run into uh, just looking at a round feature and going oh look a meteorite fell there and then the difference between well they haven't dug that there's no drilling done they haven't confirmed that as a meteorite impact so for all intents and purposes it is uh, just a hole round round thing it could be a methane burp like in Siberia or it could be another uh, thing that happened um, so I guess just being bored uh, and looking for something new um, I was looking at some features that you couldn't really say 
that didn't happen by water. And there's some other notable geologists in the area, um, up in Washington, here in Oregon, Idaho as well. Um, and, and in studying these features and understanding uh, the process by which the Pacific Northwest, the Scablands of Nevada and down through uh, California, and then you, you can continue this trend down into Mexico as well. And um, I can't even remember the reason I had a thought and decided to look up an aquifer map, find out where the water underground in the United States was. Um, and the interesting part about an aquifer map is that it lines up, at least as far as I can tell, lines up very well with the surface features. And then the surface features are, let me go just back to being a kid again, you don't need a geology to tell you how the wall of your little pond gets saturated and loose soil can fall in make your little pool a little dirty and muddy how irregular stones potentiate that erosion uh, a lot of kids don't really notice that stuff but I suppose it was a benefit of my dad kind of being a little bit of a detailed and documentary you know, documentary kind of person where he like to learn about how things were done as well um, so I grew up with a lot of instruction on things and, and told how things work um, we continue some of that just childhood knowledge that we gain um, and how things move by looking at mud puddles and um, washing uh, using hot water to rinse butter or cheese off of a plate that's an erosion process and it's a very specific thing that's happening with each one with the oils with the cheese and most people don't <laughs> sit and waste brain power I'm not wasting brain power but I could be using it actually doing the damn dishes um, but at the same time that action that everyday thing that I do in my life that you do in your life that everybody does at some time in their life when they have to get off their butt and just do their chores we find geological features and erosion in our lives and so I think to myself this just can't be it's not exclusive to just a small little area you don't need a hypo, hyper analysis and uh, reviewed papers to understand how to take a shovel and where that pit is cut out with a shovel what that looks like by some point in your life you understand the way dirt mounds up if you were to have just soft, soft loose dirt kind of how it mounds up on the shovel as you shove underneath it And I asked that, or I said that to myself, and I continue to stare at the globe, look at many different places, and a lot of it with the notion of plate tectonics and colliding continents and plate boundaries and how this 
plate boundary. It's ejecting material that's increasing the size of the plate. It's pushing these continents around. And it, I'm not seeing that flow. I don't see how that rolled down the hill. We climbed the tires and tried to do that. Some of us. Um, I know I did, but I can't. And maybe that's the problem. I can't remember too much of the tire event. Maybe I got hurt. Um, but we learn about these features. There's these, these physics. The momentum and the inertia of our bodies is we try to break them in our youth. And a bone, and comparing bone to, let's go to hydrothermal activity, and you can take hydrothermal deposition of minerals and salts, put them into layers similar to the different density and parts of our bones, you start to see similar features not necessarily exact but similar and how much of these similar things are mechanisms by which the earth functions underneath us and we don't know where we don't necessarily see it because of the scale Um, I'm, I could go lecturing on that for probably forever. Just get, hunt for mushrooms and then hunt for the smallest one you can find. You almost have to use a hand lens if you get good enough at what you're doing. They're tiny. <laughs> Fungus is a fascinating thing to study. Or, sorry, mycology for those who want to go and look it up. Um, There's places that people don't look by just the sheer function of their daily lives. Um, the, one of the places that I noticed this is actually up on, uh, just going on mushroom hunts up in the mountains. And you, there's a little hidden world on the shoulder of a hard right turn or left turn, whatever going down the mountain because when you're driving and you can see this turn approaching your focus is on driving out of the turn not looking off onto the shoulder at what goes by and I find geology features that way or uh, little turn offs and places to just look at things that you can tell people don't haven't trampled yet because they just go right by it and I think that in some of the ways that I've described scale that's the way that we go right by it we don't necessarily understand it. we have been given the explanation and and heavily lean on the notion of plate tectonics and plate boundaries to explain the duration of what must be to, to get these to where they are. But I would encourage in the just pure destructive nature of, the, of a child's mindset in trying to break something, or just, or I don't know, like, like a boy with his sister's dolls, or I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, my comparisons are weak, uh, but and it doesn't help to lose a train of thought. Um, but just in the childlike sense of these things, we know until we are told a different definition, we're corrected by education and wisdom. Uh, then when we are con corrected and we are 
Uh, it is we're given the aid that we need uh, to 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 suss out the solution. Um, it's been a really difficult time trying to figure out the way to describe what I have to describe without using the existing terminology. And I, I found myself uh, having to make sure that I didn't try to so much because when you start saying subduction or phreatic uh, volcanics or phreatic eruptions or you get into very specific things but if you get to the scale above that you have more of the codices that allows you to say okay then now we have a little bit more math to understand the uh, the overall energy needed and dynamic pressure present to cause that eruptive force to force when that when the energy is focused to, to a place that it must crack and and come up and I say it that way because it that's generalizing water fluids uh, a state of liquefaction um, molten states ice states the states vary um, and the states vary on top of each other next to each other they aren't exclusively regional regional everything touches so in geology uniformitarianism was the really the like the main like everything has to do with everything it's a consequence of earth's function and certain things if I could be an antagonistic brat just pick on the person that's trying to teach me something you better put the part at the end if you still have something because I'm going to try to find a question to ask you that you can't answer and if you can't answer it then I know that I should keep looking on my path. And one of the questions that I had was that we have technology that gives us the ability to use different methods to understand what's under our feet. And depending on how those waves the speed of those waves travel through the planet isn't necessarily any indicator of heat uh, but we do know that if you just hell I mean you could step on a piece of paper rub that piece of paper on the floor with your foot it'll be warm no one has ever and I repeat it and I'll repeat it until the day I die no one has ever drilled into a mantle plume no one has ever reached a dipstick down and said it's 1800 degrees Celsius those features that they are measuring heat are pressurized first of all because there's a lot of material on top it's a scale we don't understand just like you don't understand I guarantee how hard it is to move and survive when a building falls on you 
and you're a trapped survivor with a complete inability to move your body. We Most people on the planet don't understand that scale, or that mass, or that inability to activate any of your movement. So much bigger than that. We know that when the testings, the, the way that we are inspired to explore science when we're taught about trying to pressurize water what water pressure really is and yet I would post a notion that Mount St. Helens was completely steam related and had zero zero to do with magma. And the reason why is because Mount St. Helens would be a vent where some eruptions happened at a different state and a different scale that created the mountain to begin with. That created the portal. That portal filled with varying debris wash out collapse you know slowly as the continent yes is moving that debris is excavated off out under the bottom that you know, water frozen off the top of the mountain melts down in to the war the pressurized collapsing cavities inside the mountain that's warm that warmth allows other things to pressurize and as that tries to drain off into the aquifers these connected features they collapse and sometimes there's enough scale energy present to cause the explosions uh, we scale those explosions down in the way that we live our daily lives in the danger of uh, facilities that use flour or grain silos any particulate matter that tends to pool or uh, cloud up in, an, in a poorly ventilated space is susceptible to ignition and that ignition can be a spark, but that spark can also be static. It teaches OSHA training. I've done some of that. Um, that's another feature. Scaled up may not be appropriately uh, identified in volcanics. Where you have grains of metals, salts, minerals, all these things together, grinding together in a, in a hot cloud. We have lots of pictures of the lightning. And if you've ever engaged your inner pyro and tried to make thermite, I only tried to make it because I thought, well, if you can hold aluminum and rust you can make some cool thing that burns as bright as the sun and you know I, uh, the dumb days of playing with fire but I learned something in that and I learned that there's a feature of thermite that is not necessarily really understood by a lot of people and that's the oxidation factor the oxide in it, the Fe two O three, the iron oxide, that is what makes the reaction with the aluminum possible. And because there's oxygen present, it burns in a terminal process, and that terminal process leaves these slag balls, in and there's piles of metal slag 
They resemble a lot. I mean, really resemble volcanic material. And for the sake of posing a question, you ask a question and you have to know why you ask a question. Why do you ask that question? Because I've seen lava coming out of the ground. We know it exists. Um, but what we've never seen, we'll just call it water balloon earth, I guess, if, for lack of a better quick analogy. Um, we've never seen another planet with lava inside smash against something and go Pfft. So whatever gave us that idea that there was a giant mantle underneath us other than we needed a puddle for our floating land masses to ride on and that puddle needed to make sense because it doesn't make sense for a big sheet of rock to be floating around on a puddle and we still I would say you still have a, a, a scale problem with explaining how one side of the globe pushes this way and this side of the globe is just doing its own things the I felt like for a while now that you know while I look at the Pangea models and I'd say oh that's neat huh it's kind of dumbfounding like oh wow who was there Who saw it? And if you ask that question and you be a little bit open and you stop with the whole, it had to have been aliens. Shut up. There's another scale that we have a problem with, and the scale is time. The time that it takes for humans to just utterly. Blah, something up. We also have proven that in that, we also have the ability to do some spectacular things. In that, I would expect there is a common feature to those aspirations of ancients or people in ancient history. One of those things would be communicate with people in the future. And if you can't live till, you know, 10,000 years from now, how are you going to communicate with them? How are they even going to give an ounce of shit about what you say? Because they don't... They don't Why are you... You're going to have to figure out what you're saying. And I can't remember who did the documentary. It was just one of the ones that I watched just to see what, uh, see how people do things and study things. But uh, there was a study done by some universities and uh, really uber smart people. And they decided they wanted to figure out what it would take to preserve language, to pass that on, to pass this information set that we have now on to 10,000 years from now, assuming they're not going to speak our language. That there's, how are they going to even know to look at a rock wall? Well, I guess because we figured out through history that that's the thing that lasts the longest. So you have cave paintings and stuff going back a long time and the people that were there saw things that they didn't know how to explain 
They saw things that they didn't know how to explain, you know, turkey duck man with lightning flying out of his ears and feathers around his neck came flying out of the sky to mess some stuff up because he was pissed off about how y'all grew corn. I think it honestly because they didn't know what else to say. What else would the people 10,000 from years from now believe? Did they know what a rock was? Did they know rocks could fall from the sky? Did Elijah actually go to heaven on a chariot of fire? Um, many instances of kind of seem to me anyway like a, we don't know how else to describe this so we'll call it this we'll describe it this way and we hope that the next time the duck thing comes out of the sky with all in, you know bad intentions that somebody is going to remember that it happened and they're going to try to preserve that or document that uh, in human history it seems that there's been a lot of documenting uh, a lot of things that confusing things monsters and events that they didn't understand one of the things that they did understand was that the ground moved and I think you would be foolish if you were to really look at ancient structures across the planet you'd be foolish to avoid the correlation of a pyramid type structure they're mounding to the middle structure which I believe you would only learn over time that when the ground upheaved and shifted that the most enduring structure was a pyramid and there is a time when surely there must have been a messenger or a communication of some kind the, uh, that would share the information from culture to culture and would say, hey, hey guys, you remember the last time that the ground went uh, and all our stuff went bad? Um, you, you're, you could at least keep your house if you build it this way. Huh, really? I don't have to put that chicken thing on there, do I? Oh, no, I put a dragon on there. I don't give a shit. And they built their own things. The Nubians built them. The Egyptians built them. The Peruvians built them. There's stuff that possibly was in the Americas that we haven't necessarily proven yet. The Cahokia Mounds are pretty good. Almost seemed to be like a, if you were a lesser, more slightly more primitive or or a rural, uh, not so part of the metropolis type of culture, maybe you wouldn't have worried so much about the labor required to quarry stone. And you just dealt with dirt. But anyways, uh, it's speaking in scale here. It would appear that you could suggest easily that humans had across the planet had a common understanding about what it was what it took to survive that 
in those conditions, the conditions of then versus the conditions of now. Um, the separation of cultures due to the division of continents. Uh, uh, scale. Scale, scale, scale on everything. Um, I hope I'm going to, I'm just going to stop this one and then go into the specific detail on the first major breakthrough I had with this. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll just, I hope some of you did the look at uh, Beaverhead, thought Yellowstone, thought there must have been an impact, a crater there, and all of that is a crater. I hope some of you have thought about that. Um, because that was, as I've been able to find, only part of a larger scale thing that doesn't happen didn't necessarily happen at once more like a stacked feature with the heaviest rolling off the top or in this case sliding off of the other one. sliding off of the weaker bedding um, a lot of things that I didn't want to I don't want to put to terms. I, I, I didn't feel like it was fair to me to do that. I have an inc incredible amount of respect for... First, I'll just mention those ones. Because there's a lot of forgotten people out there that died in the field doing what they were doing, trying to find these answers. So the first is to them. I didn't get a chance to finish that story. Sorry, I'm that kind of person. I cry about everything. But they didn't have that tool. I didn't have that privilege to be uh, in prostration most of the time just thinking about things. And then uh, the respect for the people who have spent their whole lives to process what they had, the material they had, the teaching they had, the tools they were given. And, and then I, I wasn't intending to study this. I looked for something um, I thought everybody looked for you know I thought I could go and look at the range expanse from the Yukon and understand the deposition of gold and feed my family I stopped that crap a long time ago um, but There was a lot of redirection by folks that told me to go to school. And to me, school is study. Um, and sometimes, well, there has to be a first in everything. I didn't want to be that first. I've written dozens of emails to universities so I could present this and give it away. Because I feel like Almost like I've been wandering the desert with no purpose, no reason to be there, not looking for anything. 
and had some whimsical magic elf run up to me and give me the biggest treasure. somebody looking to discover something can be given. It's not mine. And some of me says, make money on it. Go take this and, as a proprietary thing and show them how the gold was deposited. Because this is going to do it. Don't make... Don't let it make you greedy. Please. I mean it. Money doesn't mean shit. It only makes it. That's honestly what scares me about this. So, anyways, I appreciate your time. Um, I haven't, it's not even 11 o'clock, so I got a lot of recording to do today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a break and then get to the next one while I post this. I'm not, I'm not going to edit anything. I don't, I'm, I'm 100% candid on the fly. It, you know, truth is truth. And it's the only thing that matters because regardless of what you say, how you say it, if it's not the truth, the truth is the only thing that ever lasts. So I hope that anyone who sees this enjoys some of the things that I've said and has got you interested in why um, I'm doing and presenting what I am. And I hope to see the children in you that died the wonder that you thought you'd never discover again and when you see what I saw <laughs> it's awesome and then it's scary because you find out that the balance keep that one in on the top of the page, balance of this planet uh, is very important. I'm not talking about climate either. It has a little bit to do with it, but I'm not on that bend. Take care.